Hi everyone, welcome back to episode 5 of I'd Quit But I'm Broke, the careers podcast brought to you by Student Beans. We hope you enjoyed last week's episode and today we're joined by John Thornton, the copywriter and social media manager at Innocent Smoothies. So Matt, obviously social media is very big, you're very good on social media. Is it something that's more of a hobby or do you think you go into a career in socials? It's a good question to be fair. I think at the minute it's definitely just a hobby. Uh, I think if you make it a career, there's quite a lot of pressure, especially as an individual. Maybe even more so actually representing a com- uh, company because, yeah. you know, what you post reflects everyone. Uh, but at the minute, I'm happy just to keep it as me messing about on the internet. Did you expect your following to grow the way it did on TikTok or was it a bit of a surprise? So uh, it's a long story, essentially, why I got started. Essentially, my one of my best friends had a bit of a following already and he was doing similar stuff to what I do now. And I kind of got a bit drunk one night and bet him I could do better. Um, so it wasn't like a complete surprise. It was it was like a calculated one, but I didn't expect it to go as far as it has gone. How do you know things are going to be like funny? Because obviously your TikToks are hilarious and you've got that in common with John today because his tweets for Innocent are hilarious. So do you ever get nervous like people aren't going to find it funny? How do you know what's funny and what's not? We delete a lot more TikToks than I care to admit. Uh, <laughs> after about an hour, if they're not doing so well, and we, we watch it back for you know the 10th time, we go, <laughs> actually, that's not that good. It gets deleted and we don't speak about it again. <laughs> I like that, yeah. Like, no, never never mentioned Yeah, that. never happened. No one saw it. That's fine. I wonder if John deletes any of the uh, innocent tweets. We'll have to find out. So let's welcome our guest for the day, John Thornton. <laughs> Welcome, John. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. So for our listeners who maybe don't know you or the work you do, could you give us just a brief summary? Yes, I'm, uh, I've done social media and copywriting at Innocence Movies. So it's basically social media is writing the silly things on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and copywriting is writing all the other silly things. So it's like people think it's like a, to do with trademarks and royalties and suing people, but it's just like a fancy industry term for writer. I don't know why they bothered adding a word copy to it. <laughs> Yeah, there was some debate actually about what copywriting means, but we'll get into that a little bit later. But no. first, we're going to start with some icebreaker questions. Okay. Um, so the first one is, what was the worst style choice you ever made? Uh, deep V-neck t-shirts. <laughs> oh, yeah. You didn't even hesitate. Yeah. <laughs> you knew straight away. Yeah, that was a regretful part of my history. <laughs> Who was your childhood actor or actress crush? Rachel from S Club 7. There was an S Club 7 movie, so she is an actress. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll let you have that one. You have to sing karaoke. What song are you picking? Can't Stop by Red Hot Chili Peppers. Ah, oh, good track. Good karaoke song, that. Nice. And finally, what is one thing we don't know about you? Uh, I want to say a subway with all 16 sources on it. <laughs> Why? Thought it'd be funny. <laughs> was it? It was, it was pretty good, to be honest. I mean, they, they put... They put too much Thousand Island dressing on it. It kind of dominated the whole thing. Yeah. Like 500 Islands would have been enough. <laughs> what was the reaction from the, uh, you know, person the, making the your sub? Artist. Yeah. <laughs> when you said, I want all 16. Well, I was, he was like, do you want any sauce? I was like, yeah, all the sauce. And he was like, all the sauce? <laughs> Dead item. All the sauce. <laughs> I love that. So we always start by asking one question. What is the worst job you've ever had? It's a toss up between... Domino's Pizza and Gala Bingo. Ooh, which one are you going for? I got paid less at Domino's, but I quit Gala much quicker, so I think Gala. Ah, uh, what was so bad about it? What was the worst thing? Well, I'll tell you the best thing, and that'll give you like the standard of the worst <laughs> thing. So on my first night, my role for the entire shift was to walk around with this this rack of one pound coins sorted into fivers. So like little, each one was in like a stack of five. Mm. And then the people would hold up fivers, tenors, and twenties, and you'd go and just swap them. Um, and that that was it. There was no chatting to them because they were too busy focused on. <laughs> they wanted silence. And then, like at the end of the shift, the manager was like, "Oh, you picked it up really quickly. Like, it normally takes people three or four shifts." And I was like, "That was like key stage one maths." <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but so that was like one of the roles, and it turned out that was the best role. Oh no. So that was the highlight of working there, was yeah, yeah, yeah. swapping five pound notes for five one pound coins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how bad did it get? What was the worst role? The worst one in like the foyer, they had a few, few like slot machines mm-hmm. and a couple of the people would, would play on those and your job was to like just 
making coffees and basically not let them leave. <laughs> but, you know, once you've made them a coffee, it takes them, like, 30 minutes to drink it. There's only, like, two people. Oh. So then you just stood there, like, just waiting. And then they finish a coffee, like, do you want another coffee? Like, no. <laughs> that's, that's... Please, have a coffee. Yeah. <laughs> I'm bored. Yeah. <laughs> And what were those people like that were there all the time? Mm. It, I don't want to stereotype, but it is kind of what you would expect from a, a girl of Bingo. Any particular characters that stood out without naming names? <laughs> <laughs> Not exactly, but let's just say there was a reason the, the seats are all plastic and easy to wipe clean. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. That's horrific. <laughs> Sorry. And how long did you last in the role? Six weeks. Okay. Not long. No. Why did you leave? Just too boring? Yeah, but it was... So I'd been a Christmas temp at Argos. This is after I'd, I'd left uni, moved back home. Christmas temp at Argos and after Christmas, that ended. So I got a job in Gala, basically as a joke with my mate. Because <laughs> we, we'd done a, a show at the Edinburgh Fringe called Sketch Bingo, which was featured some bingo, and I just thought it'd be funny. And <laughs> turns out taking a job because you think it'll be funny is not a good reason. <laughs> but then, yeah, I mean, the... So the Christmas temp roll with Argos hadn't been great, but then I went back in to pick up a pay slip, and they were like, "Oh, we do have a, we do have now a permanent one going if you want." I was like, "Yes." <laughs> Real career highlight when like you're happy to be going back to to Argos. Yeah. Well, what I would have thought when you said you worked at Gala Bingo, did you ever get to call the bingo? So on my on my last shift, like I asked if I could call one game, and like, I thought it was like a big ask because I'd not been trained or whatever. And they were like, "Yeah, obviously that's fine." They were like, "You oh. could have done that ages ago if you'd asked." And I was like, oh, maybe actually this could have been more fun. And then I got to do it and it was genuinely the most boring four minutes of my <laughs> life. Because they, they don't do like the, I mean, I already knew because I've been watching. They don't do like the, the legs 11 or the anything like that. Stuff. They literally just churn through those numbers as quickly as possible. And yeah, and so then I was literally just like reading, reading numbers for four <laughs> minutes. And the one one I was hoping for, which was 69, it came up at like fourth. So I did that. Oh. Got, got the got my little Instagram video for that. And then, <laughs> then I just had to, oh, I've got another 90 numbers to read through. Peak too soon. Yeah, yeah starting my life. <laughs> <laughs> so even being on stage couldn't save that job? No, yeah. No, no I thought that was going to be the turning point. I thought you were going to say, I called the bingo and I thought, oh, maybe I could step, but no. No. Still bad. Yeah, it was, it's atrocious. Oh, gosh. If we had to say, you've got to go back, uh, what sum of money would we need to offer you to get you back at Gala Bingo? Honestly, like probably about 600 quid a day. Wow. Steep, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But just because it's so mind-numbing? Yeah. So we always get our guests to rate their worst job from one to five. One being worst job ever, would never recommend it to anyone. Five being, you know what, it was all right. Where'd you put it? Uh, I guess I'd put a two because it was like really bad, but sort of, within the confines of the law, et cetera. Like, <laughs> yeah, I think if you if there's something really bad happens, then that's when it's a one. Yeah, fair enough. Just absolutely mind-numbing. Yeah. So we're coming up to the part in the podcast now that we call listener questions. We basically post on the Student Beans Instagram, uh, tell everyone that you're coming on, and we ask them to ask you questions. So the first one, what is the company culture like at Innocent? I've heard good things. Yeah, it's really nice. It's sort of, uh, one of my mates described it as being like at uni again. Um, so it's like very social, a lot of, just a lot of people like you're, you're actually friends with and you enjoy spending time with, like even when you're not contractually obliged to, like a good lot of them are like now just my normal friends. Um, so yeah, it's really nice. That's always quite nice. I can't really imagine the scope. Are there like a lot of people in your office? Because of COVID now, it's a little bit different. Before COVID, there was like 300 people wow. technically in our UK office, but with some like working from home and this and that. Now on a busy day, there's probably like maybe a hundred, hundred and twenty in. Okay. But it's still still quite a lot. And it's like a it's it's like a nice size. It was like it's a bit hard now because so many people have left and joined and things like that. But like before COVID, I'd at least know everyone's face and most names, and then a lot of them you'd know a bit better than that. Oh, so, that sounds yeah, good. Really nice. It's always good when colleagues become friends. Yeah. That's a sign of a good job. The next listener question is, do you get any hate on your videos slash posts and how do you deal with it? We're actually, we're pretty lucky. We get pretty minimal hate compared to most people. And so then in terms of dealing with it, it depends. Most ignore some, you know, if, it, if it's like not pro proper hate, 
we're always pretty happy taking the mick out of ourselves. We'd probably, <laughs> we'd probably just do that. Every now and then there's like, I'll decide to bite back. Like <laughs> sometimes you have to. Um, we did um, in 2020, we did a, a Christmas ad on social where we wrote like a, a pretend kids book about how we were keeping Santa safe. But it was like, it was just for social. So it was actually written for adults. Like you had jokes about Santa being furloughed and <laughs> this and that. And it, uh, it really upset the anti-COVID uh, community, which is just like the perfect community to upset <laughs> because absolutely everyone hates their guts. And so it was like, um, yeah, we just, me and my boss just doubled down. We wrote like a, a fake apology where we were like, oh, we're so sorry for trying to keep Santa safe. Like we won't, we'll kick the Easter bunny out of our bubble and all. <laughs> All of this, and we we like finished it with like we will be boycotting ourselves, <laughs> and, this, and it like just completely derailed them. And like yeah, just retweeting all the abuse we were getting, and like snapping back at them all. One person, one person was like, "Oh, your marketing team should all get in the fire." And we were like, "Yeah, it's always nice to get a death threat." Um, <laughs> we were like, "Okay, but we'll have to get in one at a time because of social distancing." Everyone thought we were stealing their children's innocence for some reason. Someone was like, "Keep your children innocent." And we're like. Sure, nice kids, but don't want them. And one of them was like, "I'm in the supermarket right now, and I've just, I've just hidden two hundred quid's worth of your stock, so no one can buy it." And it was like, we were just we treated them. We were like, like imagine just seeing someone walking around, like arms loaded with juice, hiding it behind the Pringles. Like, That's just, brilliant. Oh. I think it's good you kind of have the ability to clap back and they kind of let you do it because i mean you must get some interest in characters sending hate to a juice company yeah <laughs> well the so the worst thing we get sent um you know how sort of every winter we put the little hats on smoothies oh yes i've seen them the little knitted ones yeah so hats traditionally worn on the head right right but obviously these are quite small hats and some boys decide to send us pictures of where they're wearing those hats <laughs> ah yeah. I'm guessing they didn't get a retweet. No, no, they don't. But, uh, we we do. We have an unwritten rule that we'll we'll send it around our entire team. On the <laughs> My old boss, she, she was like, her attitude was, if I've had to see it, everyone should have to. See yeah, it. too right. <laughs> I think that's good. fair. And last listener question for the day: What is the best marketing campaign you've ever seen? Doesn't have to be your own. Uh, definitely wouldn't be my own. <laughs> um, I, I once saw a billboard for a gym. And it said, tired of being fat and ugly, just be ugly. And then an arrow to the gym, which may be a bit problematic in this day and age, but it was like very different, very alternate, like a good bit of sort of taking a mick out of themselves and and kind of their customers. Yeah, I suppose. I don't know, do you alienate customers or do it? I suppose it just depends on your sense of humor, doesn't it? We want yeah, it's, like it's stuck with me. Yeah. It grabbed your attention, which, it yeah. did its job. Yeah, true. It did do its job, yeah. So we're moving on to potential misconceptions of mm -hmm. the industry you're in. I think one of the huge ones with social media is, and you touched on it briefly, you just kind of chill around all day, not really doing any work, applying very minimal effort, and it's easy. What would you say about that misconception? Yeah, I mean, that definitely isn't the case for most social media jobs. We probably are the closest you get to that. <laughs> That sort of is our strategy, or at least to, we want. We sort of want it to give that appearance of that that's what we're doing. Uh, so actually, yeah, we work pretty hard to appear like we're not doing any work. Mm. But yeah, I mean, social. Most social media managers have to be like a graphic designer, a copywriter, a data analyst, a planner, and you have to juggle like every part of the business. So like, human resources want you posting job adverts. Um, the CEO wants you fluffing their ego by posting whatever <laughs> conference they're speaking at. This is in general, not not referencing my employers. <laughs> Marketing want this, sales want that. So you're juggling all these different people. And you're also like, I mean, we, we touched on it, you're kind of like in the firing line. Like mm. not only are you getting any, like any big company decision, you're getting hate for. So like the, the social media manager for P&O Ferries must be having a terrible week. Like they've not made, they've not fired those people, but they are going to be getting the flack more than the, the senior people and you're also you know if if you do do a drop a clanger which we all do from time to time then then the whole world sees your mistakes like mm -hmm. yeah. 
And how do those clangers go down internally? If you post something and, you know, it's not well received, who gets on your case about it and what actually happens? So we've never, certainly in my time, we've never posted a clanger we haven't been able to recover from. So, like, things like the, like that Christmas, which wasn't a clanger, but, like, we've had ones which were closer to clangers, but we've just been able to wriggle our little ways out of them. Um, So, like, the literally last week, um, my friend accidentally changed the company profile picture on Instagram to a picture from his wedding. I saw this on Twitter, actually, <laughs> yeah. Which, um, I mean, that's not, you know, that's not a big clang. That's not, like, offensive or anything. It's just a, it's a silly mistake. But, like, most companies yeah. would be, like, yeah. it'd quickly change out, just hide it and not tell anyone. I think that some, some corporations, you would probably get fired for something like yeah. that. But we're just like, that's pretty funny. Let's, let's post about that. And so uh, then we're just taking the mick out of him, like, we... Um, so we just changed like all the logos like everywhere to this picture from his wedding. <laughs> like the side of our building's got a massive innocent logo, so we like photoshopped his face <laughs> into it and things like that. Like, it was like our second best performing Instagram post ever. Wow. And like just from taking a mick out of each other. Yeah, yeah. So mistakes turn to successes almost. Exactly. Yeah, that's a smart way to play it, definitely. Yeah, I mean, that's honestly like all our best performance stuff is mistakes. Like that's what people really enjoy. Like in general, if you look at if you look at any sort of big viral campaign from a brand, it's never when it's just like normal. It's always mm. when it feels like the social media manager is going rogue. So like the Aldi Colin Caterpillar oh, stuff. Love that. Yeah, like it feels like that's just the social media manager going off on one. Mm-hmm. That's always kind of like what people like the most. Like they absolutely love it when I have a typo in a tweet, which happens quite a lot. <laughs> And there was one day where I had like two typos and it might as well have been Christmas and like <laughs> everyone was losing their minds and it's like, yeah, they love it when stuff goes a little bit wrong for me. So you mentioned that it feels like the social media manager's gotten rogue. Mm-hmm. How often is that actually the case or is it more often actually quite planned? So we don't have sign off. So we don't, we don't tell people what we're doing until mm-hmm. it's too late, uh, which is the best way to be because we wouldn't be allowed to do any of this stuff. But then once they see it afterwards, they see the numbers, they're like, oh, yeah, that was a great idea. Like, <laughs> you would not have thought this beforehand. But, you know, we kind of have a, a pretty good gut instinct. And, like, in our team, we have – they're mostly unwritten rules, but they should probably be written down. <laughs> but, um, you know, we kind of know what's what's too far and what's not. So, like, yeah, we're pretty good judges. But a lot of it, a lot of it is, like, gut instinct, reactive. It's not – Planned, planned. Like, um, a sort of our biggest moment a couple of years ago was when um, we launched this new blue drink and basically we just forgot to tweet about it. And then <laughs> someone seen it was like, are you going to mention this drink or what? <laughs> and so we had to quickly take a photo and get it out. And our, our photographer just, it was quite late. The, the light wasn't very good. And so it wasn't the, wasn't the best lit juice we've ever <laughs> done. And like the tweet wasn't very good either. I had like four product messages and it was like very boring so we were like oh hey we've got this blue drink and everyone's like it looks green and honest generally within like three seconds i went from oh this is really embarrassing like how am i supposed to answer this to like oh, i'll just say it's blue and so i just just stubbornly just retweet everyone one by one being like now nah, it's blue it's blue it's blue um and then, then like that just spiraled out of control and it, like lasted for like four days we got more retweets than a John Lewis Christmas advert. Wow. The, like the least popular one. Oh. <laughs> um, but yeah, and like, then everyone was like, oh, what a great campaign. Oh, they're so clever. And it was like, that was a complete fluke. <laughs> like, like we did not plan that. Um, but yeah, sure, we'll, we'll claim it. That's hilarious because I do actually remember seeing this all over Twitter for about <laughs> three or four days. Yeah. So you touched on how there's a lot more to the role than might meet the eye about how you have to do some graphic design, how you have to do you know, some promotion. Can you talk a bit more about that and how it might make it harder to get a job in the industry? Yeah, so it, it sort of, I guess it varies now from sort of company to company. So some have kind of cottoned on to actually f- social media is a really big deal and like a really important place to be. So like Gymshark's social team has like 20 people in it or something. Wow. And so there they'll actually be able to like specialize in different things. Um, but yeah, so especially at some smaller companies, um, yeah, you might be having to do graphic design and video editing and writing all this stuff and everything. And yeah, and so like, I mean, I have no graphic design skills. I can't edit videos. So like anything like that, I wouldn't be able to get into. Um, but I think there's sort of, 
it, it sort of it goes both ways. So it means on the one hand, if you are a jack of all trades, then there's like good ways in. But equally, some people will be looking for more like of a specialism. So it kind of you can kind of get by with either, hopefully. So I want to move on now uh, and talk about your own career journey. Mm -hmm. How did you go from Argos to Garlovin, go back to Argos to now running Innocent Smoothies internet campaigns? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I'm still not quite sure myself. <laughs> um, so I studied script writing at uni for film and TV, which is a really fun degree. And then as soon as you leave, it's just basically absolutely useless. And I kind of decided during the course that I didn't, uh, I would still quite like to write sort of TV shows, but it's like such a hard industry to break into. And it's a lot of like freelance, insecure, unstable work kind of thing. And that didn't feel like my vibe. Um, so then it was kind of like trying to figure out how can I use those similar skills to basically just want them to write silly things. Um, and so I've kind of figured that like marketing was probably about the right place because you kind of, then it's a nine to five, it's like stable kind of thing like that. Um, and yeah, so whilst I was working in Argos, I was applying for, for lots of jobs, like sort of here, where, everywhere, sort of sent about, I think like between 75, 100 uh, applications wow. over the course of like a year. Um, and I think sort of about halfway through when I hadn't been getting many interviews, I changed my CV so from quite a normal one to a much more a much more John one, just very <laughs> sort of, uh, ba basically I used the, you know, the Star Wars crawl, like the text at the start. So I used that, uh, but to write about me and like put in some Star Wars jokes and some stupid puns. And so then I started getting like noticeably a lot more interviews, but also noticeably a lot more rejections. Like before, like companies would just kind of ghost you. Whereas hit like, I got one rejection within 30 minutes of oh. like, no, we don't want you. <laughs> Uh, which is great because it was kind of like if if like if that CV which was like kind of me sort of showing my best skills if that's not working for them then it's not going to go well anyway Fair loss. yeah so it's just like a good vet in for like both parties really um, and then I I just moved to Bristol with a couple of mates because they were working like similarly rubbish jobs to Argos and we were like oh, we might as well just work these rubbish jobs together like somewhere nice. And then I got a job with a, um, it's like a little hair and beauty company. So they sold, they weren't a brand, but they sold other people's brands online. Um, and it was all, it was like, it wasn't like a startup. It was just like two guys who'd been selling it out of their garage and they'd got a bit bigger. They'd be like selling it on their glossy website and then they'd also be selling it off cheap on like Amazon and eBay and like without the retailers really knowing and stuff. Um, because they were quite small and then I had to like, pick up like just teach myself a lot of stuff so like I learned things like Google Analytics and MailChimp and all this sort of like just kind of basic nuts and bolts of marketing whilst also doing like all their copywriting and their social um, and also at the time I was freelancing for a woman who wanted to write kids stories but didn't really know how to write kids stories um, so she did all the kind of like the business side and the proposals and things and I kind of ghost wrote ghost wrote uh, the book and so I got some more kind of like I guess funner writing experience from that and I, I used to do like their customer service emails so I'd write just fun things to kids who sent in like because the book was all about spies and they'd send in like secret messages and this and that um and to be that was probably actually more important on my application to Innocent than the, the actual job I did for 18 months but um but yeah so then this job came up with Innocent who I'd kind of always wanted to I'd always like loved their social and it always been like, oh, I'd love to do social like Innocent somewhere. But I didn't think I'd get to do social at Innocent. Then, yeah, this job came up, so dusted off the Star Wars CV. <laughs> I almost got pretty lucky because the hiring manager who had like been doing our social for years is just like a good egg. And so she like, I, I, I don't think most big brands would hire someone who hadn't worked at like a decent sized brand before. But um, yeah, she took a point. You know, this is the thing with, looking for jobs it only takes that one person to make a mistake and hire you <laughs> and then you're in and it's much harder for them to get you out yeah um but also what i'd been doing because i'd been kind of like looking around for jobs for a little while um in the, the shampoo place and so i'd started just being silly on their social and like on their blog and just kind of doing it more for to be useful to me than useful to the 
business, which is a very bad thing to say. But um, it was still like good for better. Like, if to be honest, if I'd been like that creative the whole time, it'd probably been better for them anyway. Mm. But um, but yeah, you know, just making sure if anyone looked on the channels, they'd be like, oh, this is quite good, sort of thing. Yeah. Like, it's always it's always about what you get out of it as well as what they do, kind of thing. And then yeah, basically, innocent made a, a massive mistake, hired me, <laughs> and haven't been able to get rid. <laughs> Brilliant story. Contract law, eh? <laughs> so how long have you been at Innocent now? Uh, been here uh, four and a half years. Wow. And what's it like working for Innocent? What's there? What's the, what's the day-to-day life like for you? So, I mean, now now I do more of the copywriting. Um, so I'll get kind of like, I'll just get sent briefs and they'll be like, okay, so you need to write, um, you need to come up with some headlines for this campaign. And you also need to make, uh, make this boring internal travel policy sound all right so that someone will actually read it um like so quite a lot of what i do is like in the copywriting side of things it's almost like translating from corporate to human so that's like then the, the social side um which is more I'm, i used to do a lot more of that but it would be like um see so yeah, what we're going on about like messing around on the internet so i would basically whereas most people have these huge content plans they know what they're posting pretty much every day for a month uh i would stand on the overground uh train and i would write our day's tweet on that train to work uh and so i would i would see what's going on in the world and be like if it's raining i'll probably tweet about it's raining if it's national potato day i'll rank all the forms of potato uh obviously roast potato at the top or at the bottom goes without saying uh but and you know then everyone's got an opinion on potatoes um and yeah you know just try not to break things and then i can't really remember so i'd kind of do the do that tweet at the start of the day chat to a few people during the, during the day and I can't really remember how I filled my time <laughs> it was always always quite awkward if someone asked you like what did you do that day you'd be like oh, that's, that's a good question <laughs> what did I do I didn't plan anything I was definitely meant to plan things and so it, it wasn't like if I could go back I would definitely try and put more structure into place okay. but it's kind of all worked fine yeah that's, that's, a, that's a method thing. in the madness yeah exactly yeah. it was like there's definitely better ways to do it, but it did work. <laughs> it's kind of like a structured randomness, I think, is what I got from Innocent. Like, you know what you're doing, but you don't know what you're doing at the same <laughs> yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just kind of, my boss doesn't like it when I say this, but throwing a lot of shit at wall and seeing what sticks. <laughs> Good idea, yeah. Do you think there's any skills you've taken from your degree in script writing into your job now, Innocent? Yeah, for sure. It's like, because what about degree, like when I was applying for jobs, I just said, like, this guy can write a sitcom episode that's not very useful to my mop and toilet brush business. <laughs> but I guess what that degree really taught me was like really economical writing. So like scripts aren't fluffy or showy. Like the obviously the dialogue is all like what you'd see on screen, but the, the bits in between is very like you're trying to be as short and concise and to the point. It's not like just like when you're writing description in stories in school where you're like you're talking about the colours of the curtains and things like that. Mm. Like very to the point. Um, and like yeah it really teaches you to write short and clear and succinctly Um, and also you know just like entertainingly so like we wrote some for this blue drink we made an advert with Duncan from Blue which like (laughs) which I got to write it was an absolute treat Uh, and then like yeah filming that with him and we we, it did so well we wrote like two more for him oh wow Um, and so yeah that was great fun and like and it was sort of you know, it's probably, I guess, technically like the biggest thing I've written. And I, like, I've written a couple of like, TV adverts and stuff, but there's, because I'm so used to writing scripts, it's just kind of like like an afternoon's work. Yeah. Whereas these things can take ages. Mm-hmm. Comes very naturally, that's yeah. good. Was there anything that you kind of were surprised about with your marketing role that maybe went against what you'd learned about script writing? Mm-hmm. I guess I've always been surprised at like, I guess especially when I went from like, this tiny company to Innocent, I was expecting everyone to be like, like absolutely amazing like geniuses and in case they're listening to this like they are but i didn't feel like yeah, they, they were still just like human and now like when i've met people from other companies like it's like oh everyone is actually just as like chaotic and <laughs> and messy in life as i am and like even like these like you know how like when you're a, a kid and you think when you're like an adult you'd be really adulty and now you're you, now I like I am an adult and I'm like oh, I still feel like I'm 16. <laughs> it's like everyone, everyone else kind of feel, is like that as well. Which... 
I know you said it's got that university environment, which I can just imagine is so much fun. But going back to university, do you mm. think there's any transferable skills you learn at uni, non-writing related, that are helping you now in your job with Innocent? Yeah, I guess like pulling, just pulling stuff out of my ass when, when you need it, you know? <laughs> like, I mean, I was actually, my work ethic at uni was really good and I've kind of lost some of that somewhere. Uh, but I, I, I was pretty good at like being like, okay, got this essay needs to be written I'm going to sit down and, and write it. Like I wasn't a super last minute person, which I'm more am now. I think one of the really important skills in like creative jobs, which are kind of no one really teaches you or tells you about, is like knowing when it's worth doing like a seven out of 10 job in 10 minutes rather than an eight out of 10 job in eight hours kind of thing. Or like, you know, sometimes it'll be worth doing nine out of 10 job in eight hours sometimes it's better to do an eight out of 10 job in one hour. Mm -hmm. I kind of like, there's this phrase we use like time in value out, like knowing knowing what each different project needs kind of thing. Yeah. I think that's definitely a skill you need to learn. Yeah. 100%. So you took a year out, like not working what we call a proper job after uni. How did you find that? And when did you realize that you maybe didn't want to follow script writing and did want to do marketing? Yes. Yeah, so in terms of how I found it, terrible like uh gen genuinely like i feel like no one really tells you that your early 20s like post uni they really suck <laughs> um certainly like in my experience and also like i would say all of my friends had like a not necessarily that first year out but like those kind of years like one at least one like absolute stinker year like you don't have much money you don't your job's not great kind of thing um and yeah it definitely wasn't a conscious decision to take that year out like i was applying for jobs during it um but also i i kind of when i meet like people have gone in straight into like graduate roles at like big companies and have like never never cleaned the domino's toilets and things like that i'm like mm, you don't really like you don't really know what hard work is yeah, you haven't lived yeah like everyone like when i started at innocent everyone's like oh innocent's the hardest place i've ever worked like innocent is the easiest place <laughs> i've ever worked like <laughs> You, you clean the toilet for £3.53 and tell me this is hard. <laughs> so obviously you kind of did make that transition from thinking you were going to go out, be a script writer, to kind of moving into social media marketing. What advice kind of would you give to people that are going in for interviews in social media or marketing positions post grad, And especially if their degree doesn't neatly tie in, what advice would you give to them to stand out? Yeah, I think like the d degree thing, I think is probably fine. Like I, f I don't really know if are there social media degrees now? Maybe. <laughs> Who knows? They're probably, I mean, there's a script writing degree, so probably. <laughs> it's still very much an industry where, like, especially more senior people don't fully understand it. And a lot of time people just don't know, they don't know what they want until they see it. And so, like, showing people what you can do. And also, like, you know, social media is very accessible. So, like, we all have it. Like, you can be doing things on it, even though I basically don't use my own social media. <laughs> and, like, I'm, I'm not one of those, like, I didn't even link to my own social on my accounts, like, because I've got like a hundred followers, that's not a good advert for me. <laughs> um, but you know, you can so on like, but you, I'd use my CV to show that I can write funny words. And you know, if you're great at making TikToks, so find a way to use your CV to show that and kind of show people what you can do for them rather than tell people what you've done. Mm -hmm. Especially like at the start when you won't really have done anything. Yeah, actions, not words. Yeah, exactly. Something. I like that. So what do you think you enjoy the most about the role at Innocent? Getting to make people laugh, which is kind of like all I, all I ever wanted to do, um, which is partly like we're talking about that transition, like it's kind of the same end product mm. as like script writing. It's not as, you know, valued as writing a great movie that everyone loves, you know, just working for some corporation, shift in juice. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, like we're, we're really lucky. We've always had like an audience who really like, really love innocent and like love the words we write and so like especially like during the pandemic when we were still doing our silly little jokes and people being like oh i really needed this today and stuff like that's really nice very rewarding isn't yeah. it making people laugh yeah so john what are your future plans moving forward uh so i'm actually i'm actually moving role uh in a couple of months off to a startup company uh to sell cereal so that's gonna be fun uh -huh. Uh, and then, yeah, I mean, we talked about script writing. I'd still like to kind of get back into that one day. I'd, I'd like to do more shows of the Fringe and things like that. But I'm very lazy, so 
So whether I will actually ever do them remains to be seen. We'll see, yeah. yeah. So this new role, are you trying to take like a, an innocent-esque feel to the social media side? Yeah, and so I'll be writing like, it's kind of combining both roles, I've done it innocent. So it's basically writing everything. So both on social and like on the cereal boxes, which you know, I have to try and write on tiny little smoothie labels to get oh, yeah. a big old box, quite exciting. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I'm... Uh, I can't write serious things, so they, it's going to be very silly whether, whether they like it or not. <laughs> so we always round out the podcast with one key piece of advice. What would you say to students who are trying to break into your industry? Uh, I'm I'm a big fan of creative CVs, like I mentioned, and like just show, really showing yourself in that CV and not kind of not playing by the old boring kind of corporate rules and being like kind of this is what I can do and like. Yeah, putting yourself out there in that kind of way. So make yourself stand out. Yeah, exactly. Which is what the what they they all they're gonna want from their social media. Yeah, well. I, I think that's such a genius idea. Where do you draw the line between fun and creative and professional? How do you get that balance in a CV? I guess it's like you still want to get across that information, but it's like how you frame it. So like you'll see these people who like they'll be applying for Netflix, so they'll just make it look like the Netflix homepage, but then they'll like that core information will still be there. So even in like mine, like the, I still get get across like I have done this, I have done that kind of thing. But like almost like you, I guess it's almost like clickbait in a way. Like you want the big flashy headline that gets attention. So in, in my case, it's the Star Wars theme blaring out <laughs> and this and that. And then you kind of, as you start to get to the actual like meat of it, then you kind of a bit more focused, but still keep it in like that, in that tone or whatever. Mm -hmm. I think also, it's like I mentioned the Netflix thing. I like those are always good when you see them, but like that's so much work for one application. I think what like what's great is to get to quite like a modular CV, so where you can just like pop bits in and out. So like for so especially when I was starting out, I might be applying for copywriting roles and social roles and PR roles, but like ninety percent of that CV would be the same. I'd just slide in and out li little different bits depending on the one because it, it like shopping is so time consuming and you yeah. don't want to be like it's, it's good to tailor an application to a role and things like that but you also want to be getting a, a half decent number out. it's like finding that balance between again like i was saying like time in value out mm. yeah. yeah good advice work smarter not harder there we go <laughs> and i think that's it for today thank you so much for coming on today john it's been a pleasure oh thanks for having me yeah good to get out of the house <laughs> it's been great to have you Oh, cheers. If you've enjoyed this week's episode, please leave us a like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from. Next week is sadly the last episode of this series, but we'll be joined by Chelsea Tucker, who's a data scientist who brings her work to life through digital art. So make sure you tune in. See you soon.